In this chapter, we're going to look at what are the overall costs of capital for a firm. So this is perhaps one of the most important aspects of um, corporate finance. So we learn about how to compute net present value and internal rate of return and profitability index. A very important component in those calculation and evaluation is the required return by the company. So in this chapter, we're going to address the this, this question. That we call that the cost of capital. So the cost of capital, capital here refers to the uh, funding that a firm re, re, um, receive and cost Instead of a dollar amount here, the cost here is expressed as a percent. So the required return in here is the discount rate that we use to um, compute net present value. So one of the very important um, thing to remember is that this required return should be based on the risk of the cash flow. So um, what are the risks? And we're going to take a look at that um, throughout this chapter. In order for a project to add value to the firm, it has to earn at least the required return. And we talk about that. So what is the required return? What is challenging here is that the, uh, the investors for a firm um, are many and they have different requirements. So if you take a very basic, simple view, if you look at the balance sheet of a company, we saw that uh, at the minimum, a company gets money from bondholders and stockholders. So the required returns should include both the bondholders and the stockholders. So how do we balance their required return? So we show that there is a way we can do that. So to start with, we're going to do a quick review on how to compute the required return by stockholders and the required return by bondholders. And we're going to refer it, we're going to call it cost. But remember that the term cost here in this chapter is actually referred to the return. So what is the return associated with equity? So cost of equity has um, we, we have learned how to compute the cost of equity. In fact, um, there are two approaches we can estimate the required return. Um, one is using the dividend growth model, and the other is to use the security market line or capital asset pricing model. So when can we use one model versus the other? First, if you look at the dividend growth model, remember that this is the constant dividend growth model. So in order for us to, this, to use this approach or this model to estimate the cost of equity or the required return by equity holders, we must have constant growth. So if the company does not follow a constant growth model, we cannot use this approach. But if it does, then it's relatively straightforward. Um, the required return is the sum of dividend yield plus capital gains yield. And if the, it is a, if the company follows the constant growth model, the capital gains yield is the same as the constant growth rate. So this model then translates into dividend yield, which is dividend in year one divided by the price in year zero today, plus the constant growth rate. So let's take a look at a quick example. So let's say you have a company that pays that is expected to pay a dividend of the dollar fifty. So we know that this is dividend in year one because it's expected to pay. So this is dividend next year. So this is dividend in year one. We know that the growth rate is steady, so you satisfy the constant growth requirement, and the growth rate is five point one percent. The price, the current price, so that is price today. So the price today is $25. So the dividend yield is $1.50 divided by $25. So that's the first part. And the growth rate is 5.1%. And the overall required return for the stock is 11.1%. So as we mentioned, the advantage of this model is relatively easy to use. The disadvantage is that it only applies when the company has constant growth, uh, constant dividend growth. Um, and then the other disadvantage is that it is uh, very sensitive to the estimated growth rate. Um, this is a disadvantage. However, this, this disadvantage applies to every single model because estimating the future is difficult. 
and our estimates are always very sensitive to our input parameters. The biggest disadvantage of this model, perhaps, is that it does not explicitly consider risk. So if the risk of the project is very different than the current business risk of the firm, this model is not very uh, applicable. The second approach we can use to compute the cost of equity is to use the capital asset pricing model or security market line. Remember that the capital asset pricing model relies on the risk free rate and the market risk premium and also the systematic risk of the stock. So the capital asset pricing model says that the return is the return of the stock. So E here stands for equity. But the form of the equation remains the same. So here, this is the systematic risk of the equity times the market risk premium, and add that to the risk-free rate. So let's say you have a company that currently has a beta of 0.58, and the current risk-free rate is 6.1%, and the market risk premium is 8.6%, you can compute the cost of equity. So we start with the risk-free rate, which is 6.1%, and we take the systematic risk, which is 0.58, and we multiply that by the market risk premium. Now, in this case, we are given the market risk premium of 8.6%, so we do not have to compute that. We can just use 8.6%. If we are given the market return, then we have to compute the market risk premium. So when we multiply by 8.6%, we get the overall required return for this stock is also 11.1%. Now, obviously, that's not going to happen all the time. Most of the time when you use the two approaches, the dividend growth model and the capital asset pricing model, the two will not give you exactly the same answer then you are forced to choose one model versus the other. You can either do that and see which model is more appropriate, or you can average your estimate between the two models. So that's another option. You estimate the cost of equity using both models, both approaches, the dividend growth model and the capital asset pricing model, and then you take the average of the two estimates. Um, in a lot of cases, you also do not have a choice. If a company does not follow the constant growth model, you have to use the capital asset pricing model. Or a company that's not publicly traded, you cannot use the um, capital asset pricing model and you have to use the dividend growth model. So the advantage of the capital asset pricing model is that it adjusts for risk because you, you actually have to know what the systematic risk of the stock is. and you so say it's applicable to all companies as long as we can compute beta. And in order to do that, that means this company has to be traded publicly on the stock market. Uh, the disadvantage of this model is that you have to estimate the expected market risk premium, which is sensitive and is difficult to do. Um, the good news is that you can outsource this task. You can, um, you can look at what the um, market uh, overall market um, estimation is, and also um, a lot of analysts and economists um, conduct this forecast. So you can do, you can, you can uh, look at what their forecast is, um, and then you also have to estimate beta, which is a less difficult task. Um, and then lastly, is which is very important, is that you are relying on the past to predict the future. Um, again, this. Um, disadvantage applies to all methods, even when we are doing, uh, regardless of the model approach you use, you, you always take this risk. So here's a brief review on how to compute the cost of equity using the constant dividend model and the capital asset pricing model. Next, we're going to look at the cost of debt. Remember that cost here is referred to as the required return. So what is the required return for debt? Um, the best estimate that we can use is the yield to maturity. So to find the cost of debt, basically we are computing the yield to maturity. Again, we're assuming that the 
um, business risk of the project is similar to the business risk of the firm as a whole. If the business risk of the project is very different from the business risk of the firm, you will need to use other approach. Um, another approach is to look at um, what the current yield maturity is on bonds that we have, uh, bonds that have similar ratings. So if a company is going to engage in a very high risk project and that's going to change the bond rating for this project uh, or the company as a whole, then you will want to co compute the yield maturity for those bonds instead of the current bond of the firm. Uh, one thing that we want to emphasize is that the cost of debt is not the coupon rate. It is the yield to maturity. So let's take a quick example to review how to compute yield to maturity. So again, we have done this before. So we have a bond that has 25 years to maturity. It's a coupon rate of 9% is paid semi-annually. The bond has a price of $908 and it has a face value of $1,000. What is the cost of debt? So remember, we need to find the yield to maturity. So we know that to find the yield to maturity, we need this component. We need to know what the payment, the coupon payments are. We need to know the face value of the bond. We also need to know the price of the bond today and also the terms of the bond. So these are the things we need. The coupon payment, we know that the coupon rate is 9%. So that means it's $90 every six months. And this bond is paid on a semi-annual basis. So that means the coupon payment is $45 every six months. The face value is $1,000. And the price of the bond is $908.72. And we oftentimes put that as an outflow. He has 25 years left to maturity. Again, we get paid twice per year, so that's 50. And now we can use our financial calculator to find the yield to maturity. So we want to first clear off our time value of money uh, functions. So 45 is our payment. 1,000 is future value. And then $908.72. And we need to change that to negative is our present value. 50 is the number of time period. We are computing the interest. So it turns out that the interest is 5% when we compute I. And because this is a semi-annual compounding bond, our yield to maturity per year is 5% times 2. So our yield to maturity or cost of debt is 10%. The last capital structure that we want to review is preferred stock. Remember that preferred stock is a typically paid the same dividend every single period. And, and since uh, stocks do not have expiration date, the dividends are expected to last forever. So preferred stock is a perpetuity. And the required return or cost of preferred stock is defined as the dividend divided by the price. So preferred stock is probably the easiest <coughs> calculation. So let's take a look at a quick example. Let's say you have a company that have a preferred stock uh, that pays a dividend of $3. Uh, just as a reminder here, if you are not given the dividend amount, that preferred stock typically has a pot value of $100. Even though that can change from preferred stock to preferred stock, if you are not given a pot value, assume that is $100. If in this case, the, you are given the face value. So the preferred stock has a, um, a price of $25 and a dividend of $3. So the cost of preferred stock um, is the required return. So the required return for the preferred stock is the dividend of $3 divided by the price of $25. So it has a required return of 12%. Okay. Now you know how to compute the cost of common stock. You can use two methods, um, either the constant dividend, dividend growth method or the capital asset pricing model method. For cost of debt, you need to compute the yield to maturity. 
and for console preferred stock, it is computing the required return for a perpetuity.